Met Jesus on a pilgrimage, still walking. I'm Andy Doyle, the Bishop of Texas, and that's my six-word autobiography. My hope for this podcast is to walk with you and talk with you about God, the church, and where we're headed next. Who is the Lord of your life? This is a good question today as important, I think, as it has been over the centuries of Christendom. We repeat every Sunday, and we often say in our prayers, and we certainly say in our creed, that we believe in one Lord. What does that even mean? And what does it mean today? Well, let me say at the outset that the truth is that I find in one's own spiritual life, in one's own private prayers uh, uh, and uh, personal use of address to God that it's important to find something for you that has some meaning, right? So, you know, I, I just find that we have many ways of expressing our conversations with God, and I want to encourage that uh, from the deepest part of your heart and to find that language and conversation. I like the various forms of address provided in the historic prayers and liturgies of the church. And in some way, privately, um, I do that as well. And I tend to use, just probably out of my own practice, right, of doing liturgy constantly and being in prayer and leading worship, that the names that I use for for God typically are ones found uh, in the prayer book. Lord, though, is a term that we use for God as the church, and there's part of what I want to make the distinction about. As the church, and as a very ancient reference that I feel is important, and I want to talk deeply about today, so that as we profess together, and when we're together, we have some understanding of what we're doing. Uh, other than I find uh, meaning in various forms, I often think about the form Jesus used, which is Father, of course, uh, but that's how he addressed. He does that in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? He does that from the cross. He uses that quite often. But Lord is particular to our tradition, our ancient tradition, and to the church itself. It's a term that we don't really use anymore in public, it's it's not something you didn't all call me Lord Bishop when I, when I got here. Partly because I'm not a lord, I haven't been granted a lordship or any property in England, as far as I know. So uh, it's not you know in America we don't we don't do that. But there are Lord Bishops uh, in England still, uh, and it is a term with some form of political meaning there, uh, and even uh, where it's still used politically, right, in the House of Lords, it is not often uh, used even in public in the United Kingdom. There's a good amount of debate on its usage in the church, too, and I think I ought to just name that so that we can uh, uh, understand it. But today, uh, this Sunday, as I ponder, I'd like to offer the reason why I think the term is important for, for our use in worship. You say that I do not believe that people have uh, ever particularly thought Uh, of Lords as a popular term. Uh, It's never been something, uh, other than maybe if you were a Lord, (laughs) uh, you thought was that great. (laughs) Uh, uh, No, uh, uh, but consider our passage, our passages constantly that we read uh, from the Old Testament. Uh, The Lord of Egypt was the Pharaoh, right? So uh, think about how they would have thought of the Pharaoh. Uh, It wasn't positive, uh, I I, I promise you. And uh, if we think of the lords of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, who took the people of Israel out of uh, of Israel and took them all to Babylon, or at least most of them to Babylon. Uh, And there were the Greek and the Roman lords, and uh, even kings of Israel who were lords were not very popular. So we might think about the time, Jesus' time, right? Uh, and the uh, Herod, the Herodian uh, uh, Tetrarchy that was uh, present at that time, the three kings all ruling over uh, Israel. Uh, And Jesus um, speaks of uh, himself, of the negative aspects of worldly and religious lords. And he says, I have not, think about that passage. Uh, He says, I have not Uh, lorded over you, but have called you friends, right? So even Jesus offers a a 
a cultural understanding that lordship was not a positive aspect of the world in which we live. It's partly why I don't like being called Lord Bishop, by the way. Uh, we certainly know that the centuries that have followed Jesus' own resurrection up until now is filled with lords um, uh, over people and their lordship do awful and terrible things to the people and trusted to their care. I always think of that funny scene from Monty Python's Holy Grail. Now, you all probably have much better taste have ever seen that movie. Uh, but there is a peasant who refuses to recognize King Arthur uh, because a lady of the lake had given him a sword and sees his actions as Lord as violence inherent in the system and a good reason, as I quote, for an anarcho-syndicalist commune. <laughs> so, you know, they're playing with the idea of popular lordship. Lords in scripture and tales and mythologies in our own history and the history of the church really are not that popular. So why is it? Why is it that we choose that word to reference God? Why is it that in the second part of the creed, we name God as Lord to describe God and particularly the person of Christ Jesus as Lord. It's because God, the creator of all things, God is maker of the cosmos and mysteries and universe, the visible and invisible. Think of all those beautiful pictures from the web telescope we can look online. God is great. And so maybe that's the reason why it seems natural to do so. We form our daily lives and we order our faithful lives on the notion that we worship a God and uh, that is bigger than we can imagine even, right? And creator of all things. And that we exist even by God's pleasure on a regular and daily basis. We serve this God through acts of mercy and sharing what we have through worship and good works um, and we orient our lives around this Lord. Yet perhaps there's more. There's this reality, I think, that the revelation of God through the person of Jesus Christ shows us that God as Lord is different. And this may be the reason. I would offer it is the reason. This God who we claim as Lord is a Lord of peace and a Lord of love who desires a relationship with the cosmos and all humanity. This Lord is not the kind of lords of this world. And if we do not turn our lives and our faith towards a Lord of love, right? If we do not do that task of orienting our lives to a different Lord in this world, of whom Christ Jesus reveals that lordship to us, then we're going to serve a lot of other lords. We will serve the lords of this world. We will serve the lord of our own ego. What I want, what I desire. And we will orient our lives around that. We will serve the lord of money and economy, believing in that great bumper sticker. The one with the most toys wins, right? We will serve the Lord of feeling and body and affections and believe that somehow we are at the center of the universe and that everything else is object to be observed. We'll serve the Lord of addiction. So many families, so many families today faced with people or struggling themselves with lives of addiction, lords, that actually possess and bind. We will serve the Lord of lies <laughs> and we will create a universe that is built upon our perspective and the Lord of flies. That's an ancient name. Uh, it comes from the evil Lord who is uh, second in charge of the burning inferno. So powerful is the Lord of flies that he challenged even Michael, the archangel in our Christian mystagogy. 
we will always as humans find ways to seek direction. And that's part of the problem. We're kind of built this way to find Lord, the Lord. And it's why we get confused, quite honestly, is that St. Augustine believed we were built to seek God. And we get confused about who the Lord that we're supposed to follow is by our own nature of desiring to follow. And by calling upon God and Christ Jesus as Lord, we are proclaiming that the Lord we worship offers us such love that we actually can't separate ourselves from that love, says Paul. Love, forgiveness, mercy, goodness, kindness, this is the Lord of life, the Lord we worship. Is not a lesser God of this world that promises freedom from death through the accumulation of all of the stuff. No, we believe in a Lord who recognizes death and brokenness and reaches out a hand from the hardwood of the cross to save us. The last thing I would say about this Lord is that when people are oppressed, they cry out and they cry unto a Lord not of this world who will undo the powers of this world. They need a Lord big enough to rescue them. You can think of our own story of Sarah, wife of Abraham, Rebecca, and Isaac, Leah, and Jacob, the ones who were fearful of being sent out into the desert, the ones who were fearful nobody would be uh, born from them, the ones who were afraid they would die in the desert, um, uh, they would never reach the promised land, the war, the war, the war burden, the people in the Gulf today, the enslaved people of Africa when they were brought over, and how all of that bubbles up a sense of uh, Israel and, and the Holocaust and that we need a God big enough, bigger than all humanity and all our kind of perverse lords. And so to call upon the Lord as the oppressed has great meaning. And they call upon the Lord, it is a defiant prayer. It's a prayer that rejects all the other lords of the world and their powers and principalities. It rejects injustice by any means. They're calling upon the Lord of love and mercy to comfort them. Comfort, comfort, says God. Comfort my people who presents in our darkest hours and light, strength through our faithfulness and hope, and hope in our hopelessness. They call upon a Lord that's different than the lesser gods of this world. So is it no wonder that no matter what's said from this pulpit on any given Sunday, the very next thing we do is remind ourselves who the Lord is and that we believe in that Lord. And that Lord is bigger than our brokenness that we bring into this space. That that Lord is big enough to take and hold the things we wish we had not done this week. Big enough to hold the brokenness of the world, our fears and our concerns for it, but also for children and what will be next for us. This is the Lord that we proclaim. It's the one we bring our prayers to next, right? Right after the creed, we pray to this Lord who is greater than all the powers of this world. And then to this Lord, we say, I'm sorry that you weren't the Lord of my life this week. Next week, I'm going to try better. And then... And then you are blessed by this Lord. And this Lord opens himself to us in the breaking of the bread and says, I come among you, not like the world, not like the Lord's that you already know, but like one you have rarely met. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Amen. Thank you for listening. Join me in conversation on Twitter at Texas Bishop and spread the word about this podcast by leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you.